like to ask you to take out your Bible and take out a sermon outline. If you don't have a sermon outline, there's guys that are here that are going to hand one to you. If you don't have one and you're in the balcony, they're right at the top of the stairs. Um, maybe you can signal someone to go get one for you. Um, but I just want to encourage you to take your Bible. Today we come to the final message in the book of Titus. Today we come to Titus message number 29, and I've entitled it, Why We Need Titus. If you have your sermon outline, go ahead and circle that at the top of it. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning, why we need Titus. What would possess a church or a pastor to lead a church to spend 29 hours in the study of Titus. It's only three chapters. When I came here to Sheridan Hills, my very first Sunday here, I preached on John 1, 1. And about six or seven weeks later, Miguel Morgado came to me and he said, Pastor, if I do the math, It's looking like if you go at this rate, it's going to take us two years to get through John. It took us three years to get through John. But in studying the book of John, we became very, very well acquainted again with the beautiful thing called the Christology of John or the who is Christ Who is really Jesus, second person of the Trinity, Savior of the world, prophet, priest, and king? And so as we looked at that in depth, two things happened. Number one, we looked at a series of doctrines within the book of John that really affected us, but there's a second thing that we pray is also happening in the way that we study the Bible together. It is our prayer that as we move verse by verse, concept by concept very often through the beauty of God's word that you as a Christian, you as an individual are seeing that God's word can really be known. That you can learn and you can see and you can hear from God through his word. That each word means something that it really does matter. You see, many people pick up the Bible, they start reading, and they go, what's that about? What does that mean? And very often, they'll just close the Scripture because they go, I read it, and I, don't, I simply don't understand. That can be two things. It can be, number one, that perhaps your heart yet has not accepted the basic premise that you need God and that you need to turn from your sins and turn to God, Christ calling upon him as your savior. That's, that's one of the first things that will help you to understand all of scripture is coming to Jesus. But there's a second thing that maybe needs to happen is, is that we need to submit ourselves to the beauty of God's word. So our church seeks to diligently do that. And by evidence of that, last, last January 20th, Sunday, January 20th, we began the study of this great little powerhouse book. And on that Sunday, we read the book of Titus. Many of you, you had never read the book of Titus before, and you read it that time for the, for the very first time. And so this morning, we are going to read the book of Titus again, and then we're just going to make some very, very brief overview observations that I believe um, tell us the reason we need Titus as Christians in 2018. The first thing I want you to notice is on the screen, in fact, this is not on your outline. But in Joshua chapter one and verse eight, notice this at the very beginning of Joshua's leadership over the nation of Israel, he says this, this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. So Moses' instructions are this. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. God is saying, you are to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then, look what it says, and read the last passage with me together. For then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. Now the picture is this, is that God is saying, if you come to me and come to my word and you come to submit yourself to my word, your life is going to be what it needs to be. 
you're going to prosper truly in the things that really matter. Now, this isn't prosperity theology. There's many people that would take that verse and run with it that God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and have no problems and pain. That is not at all what Joshua 1 is saying. But we are seeing that God promises that when we stay in his word, that our life comes to a place of true spiritual prosperity in being near to him. But that doesn't happen apart from his word. Look at the second passage. So that's Old Testament. I want you to see the New Testament. In 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, one of Titus's friends, in fact. And look what he says. Paul writes this. He says, in fact, let's read this all out loud together. It's very simple. It's in large print on the, on the screen. Let's read it. Are you ready? 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13 says... Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. You see, the public reading of Scripture is something that is good for God's people to do. In the Old Testament, we see at different times, the, con the whole congregation is gathered together and they read the words of God and the, and the whole church stood, the, the congregation stands in one instance and, and revival and, and beauty comes out of them hearing the word of God read in worship. And so God's word speaks to us. And when we as a congregation uplift the word of God, God's word revives us. In Psalm 119, 107, it says, Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. That's on every pen that's in the pew that's here. And the reason that we have that there is to remind us that God revives us according to his word. So look at the screen again, the next part. Why, why we need Titus in our personal life and in our church life, this letter shows us. And this, so that's what we're going to do. I want us to review a little bit and remember. And I'm going to read chapter 1. I'd like to ask um, Mr. Spee to go ahead and come and also Mike Todd to go ahead and come. And they're going to help me so my voice um, can hold up as we go here. And they're going to read um, chapter 2 and chapter 3. So gentlemen, you come. Um, everyone, if you would, take your outline and notice here with me. Titus chapter 1. And as we read it, let these truths pour back over you and say, yeah, I remember that. Maybe you can think of things in the sermons that you heard over the last 29 messages and allow this to wash over you again. Chapter 1 and verse 1 is the greeting. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies promised before the angels began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Very, very significant. So that's who's writing it, Paul, and he says, to who? To Titus, verse 4. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God, the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. Immediately he goes into the qualifications for leaders. Verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery and insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now remember, those who contradict it, that's what we see in verse 10. False leaders that are there. Verse 10 says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. You remember, those are the legalists coming back saying, you have to go back to the law. Verse 11, They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain, 
what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the face, not faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Now, we called that the serrated edge of God's Word when we studied that. You remember we had um, uh, George Ramos here, uh, the five-star chef that's going to fix dinner for the school, the five-star chef, and he brought all of his knives, and we looked at this idea of a serrated edge, a jagged edge. And sometimes God's Word has a jagged edge, and it's not merely to hurt us, but it's to warn us and to show us and to rebuke people and rebuke us so that we might know the danger of false doctrine and the danger of our sin. Look at verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the undefiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Verse 16, they profess to know God, but they deny Him. By their works, they are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Mr. Spee? But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, work kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of, our God, our, of God our Savior. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works." Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once, and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All those who are with me send greetings to you. 
Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Thank you. The beauty of God's timeless words for his people. As we look from Genesis to Revelation, as we look from Titus 1.1 to Titus chapter 3 and verse 15, these are beautiful words that we need. And we need them personally, and we need them corporately as a church. And so that's why we say, I believe that God's word has been speaking to us and moving in us and working in us. There has been many things over the last few months as we have studied this that you have left saying, wow, I need to respond to God based upon what I heard today. Some of you even went home a few weeks ago and looked at your children and said, uh, what is daddy, you know, what are your perceptions of how daddy is about this or about that? Some of you did that. Many of you have come back to me and said, my husband or my wife or my children spoke truth to us, and we are starting to, even in a new way, hold one another accountable in our family to be true Christians in the way that we live. You see, this is part of the intention of God's Word, that we would constantly look and see the big picture of what He is saying. So, why do we need Titus in our personal life and in church life? This letter shows us, I think, four things that we can just boil down for Sheridan Hills this morning. The first one is this, and warm up your pen because we're going to go fast here. Number one, the Bible's, this is one of the things that we need to see, is the Bible's contemporary relevance throughout history and today. It's very interesting, this, this word contemporary I chose to use, the Bible's contemporary relevance throughout history and today. The word contemporary, if you look at the word a little bit, what is the main root word that is there? Look at the screen. Temporary, right? That's the, that's the root word. But the prefix of the, of the word is the word con, C-O-N, which means with. So with the temporary is the idea. When we, when, when, whenever we talk about contemporary, I want us to see here that God's word is contemporary. It's with the present temporary moment. In fact, it's in this moment. That's, that's the idea. And I want you to see that God's word is good for us. We looked at this heavily last week where we looked at geographical places. We looked at bi biographical things, at the actual names of people that are in this letter. This is an actual letter. There's the seasons of the year. Paul's saying, come to this other city. Um, that's where I'm going to spend the winter. So when these guys take over, Titus, you, you're getting some things straightened out. And it's a very practical thing for that moment, but we We've also been seeing it's a very practical thing for this moment. And let me tell you that the Christians who lived in the year 800 in Europe and in North Africa and in the Middle East that, were, that are, had become believers during that time, I can guarantee you that there were things that they were dealing with that they would read Titus and they would say, wow, this is like it was written yesterday. And then around the year, two, uh, around the year 1,000, there's, there's evidence that people were reading the book of Titus and saying, wow, this is, this is powerful for us right now. And then you fast forward all the way to the Reformation and we see all of God's word taking over more and more being elevated again. We see the contemporary nature of that. And then here we come again to it even in our present day, 500 years later, and there are so many things in the book of Titus that we go, that's today. Same things today. And so I want you to see this. The one big thing that comes first is this. The unchanging gospel of salvation and the power for life found in Christ. This is seen throughout the New Testament and it's seen throughout all of New Testament history since the New Testament church. And we can even go back, if we know the grand story of all of Scripture, creation, fall, redemption, glory, we see that God has had a plan from the beginning to make a people for himself. And so the grand picture of the unchanging gospel is something that I think that we can look at this and we can see in the gospel of Titus um, or in the letter of Titus, uh, the gospel that is so prevalent throughout the rest of scripture. Number two, the unchanging foolishness of false spiritual 
leaders. This is something that I quite honestly have been amazed by over the last three years. Since we studied Jude, since we studied James, and now since we've been studying Titus, and I've just come to notice it throughout the New Testament, false leaders after false leaders after false leaders, and not only in the New Testament, but if you look back in the Old Testament and you look through the history of the nation of God's people, you see righteous and good leaders and you see unrighteous and false leaders all the way through. And so this is part of the fallen world that we live in, is that there's people who come in the name of God teaching that which is not true and deceive people not only for their own gain and for their own kicks in all of this, but sometimes even to deceive people in hurting them. So we need to recognize the foolishness of false spiritual leaders, and that's throughout history. The third thing, the third bullet there that is good for us in this contemporary relevance idea is this. The unchanging battle between God's truth and Satan's lies and distractions. So there, there's always this battle going on in our fallen world where God's, God's truth is here and God's truth is being proclaimed, but the, the enemy rages against that truth. And the nations roar against that truth. If you go back and you look through the Psalms, and if you go back and you look through the prophets of the Old Testament, you see that the nations, in all of their self-sufficiency, in all of their pride, in all of their arrogance, rage against God. And we can even look in our own heart and see this great resistance that we have to God's truth that very often wells up in our flesh. And yet His Spirit is ruling and reigning over his, through his truth that brings to, pass, brings to pass his great salvation in our lives. So there's this battle between God's truth and Satan's lies. The fourth one that is here is the unchanging tendency of the church to act like the world. And right out there to the side, this is very sad. I mean, this is the part where if we were Mr. Rogers, we would say, this is very sad. He usually didn't talk about sad things, glad for that, but he would sometimes, he, was, he really talked about emotions. Some of you have seen the documentary, but this is, this is where it's sad. And the sad thing is, is that God's people who have come and tasted of who he is and have begun to come and see what he has done for us, we still gravitate toward our flesh. We still gravitate toward the world. We still act like the world. Now, what we want to do in the course of our Christianity, in the course of our personal walk with God and our corporate walk as a church, is that we would walk more and more and more under the truths of God's word and less and less and less with the values of the world. And so, but here we see that the church, all of these churches on Crete, they kept dancing with the world and in part because of false leaders, but also in part because of their own hard hearts that they needed to repent and come back to the truth just as the church needs to learn to walk in the truth of God. Look at the last unchanging thing that is here. We see the beauty of this, the unchanging call for Christians to live and show or share the gospel faithfully. Christians are called to live the gospel. And Titus tells us that. If you're a Christian, act like it. Don't deceive yourself. Don't think that you can look nice and shiny and spiritual on Sunday and get in your car and pull out of the parking lot and start talking, looking, sounding, and living like a fallen world and think everything is okay. No, Christians are actually called to live the gospel here, and we're called to live the gospel wherever we are. And as we live the gospel wherever we are, the world takes note of that. And the world sees us in this. And this is one of our greatest witness opportunities is that they see our life and they hear our words and come to also believe upon Christ. 
Now, number two, one of the other things that this letter shows us is the, criti is the critically important necessity of faithful church leaders. The critically important necessity of faithful church leaders. You see, that is where verse one, and, and you know what, this morning, you're gonna need to flip your thing over, your, your outline over back and forth a few times. I want you to just notice a couple of things as we point these out. Just flip your, your page back over, and if you're one of these guys that folds it in half, this is going to be difficult for you this morning. It may not work. Just, just leave it wide open and just kind of look with me. And look what it says in verse 5 of chapter 1. So chapter 1 and verse 5. Immedi and, and just notice where this is. It's right at the beginning. It's after the greeting, which is 1, 2, and 3. And it's after that, that address of 2 Titus. The first thing out of the box that he has to deal with is that Titus, you got to get new leaders. These churches are messed up because the leaders are messed up. And church family, we need to let Titus be one of these messages in one of these places in Scripture that show us how important it is for all the years in the future, however long God gives us, or ever how long God gives you as part of this church, we need to be passionate about the fact that we only want faithful leaders. You see, when the church lets down its guard over who is leading and teaching the truth, that's when the church gets messed up. And so notice this with me. In verse 5 it says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put re what remained into order. So there were still things that needed to be done. So Paul takes off, and he says to Titus, Appoint elders in every town. And then verses 6 through 9, we see those qualifications also given in Peter, also given uh, mainly in Timothy. But here we see these qualifications. And then the next section is all of the problems of the wrong leaders, all of their wrong motivations and their problems. Now, safely flip your sheet back over again. We're going to have to do that a little bit here. It's okay. Notice with me, and number two, the critically important necessity of faithful church leaders. Number, the first one that is there is the leadership is a critically important issue for the true church. It's just good for us to recognize that. That's always been the case. Leadership is throughout our lives. We looked at a long list. When we looked at those verses, we looked at a long list of areas in our lives, from education to military to business to government to all of these things. Leadership is an important thing that is part of that, and that's certainly true in the life of the church. We need to remember that. The f second one there, the, bu the bullet that says, elders, pastors must meet biblical, biblical qualifications. You, not just anybody can do that. And this is, this is part of the point, that God has a plan, and God has a set of qualifications by which he blesses the church as he gives them leaders. The third one, elder pastors must have godly, and there's two things, godly character and godly doctrine. Now this convicts me, because I'm not a perfect person. There's things in my life that, that I struggle with just like anyone else. And I, I, I have to be constantly saying, Lord, my character, Lord, come and be the savior of my character. Come and be the savior of my doctrine and what I believe. Come and teach me the truth. Now, that, that has to be very much part of the heart and the life and, listen, the practice of anyone who's going to stand before God's people and say, this is what God says. If someone is going to stand before the congregation and say, this is what God says, his life needs to be in line with what God says. And so we see this, that he must have godly, and it's important to note, character and doctrine. He can have right doctrine, and if his life does not f live out that doctrine, you got a problem. He knows the right thing to say, but he doesn't do it. Or what about people that are, they, they seem to be very, very good in, in the way that they live, they have no skeletons, they have no, no issues that are there, but they just don't know sound doctrine, and they're just not... It, they're just not gifted as a teacher of sound doctrine. Well, they shouldn't be a pastor. They may be a good person, but they may not be the one that needs to be leading the congregation. Those two things have to come together for the pastors of the church. 
So look at the fourth one that is here. Elder pastor must hold fast to the word. He must hold fast to the word above everything else. You see, he can be a pretty good business guy, but that does not qualify him to be a pastor. He can be a pretty eloquent speaker, that doesn't qualify him to be a pastor. He, he can be a real leadership visionary kind of guy, but that doesn't qualify him to be a pastor. He has to be one who holds fast to the Word of God. Because you see, all of those other qualities he can use in, to lead the church away from the Word of God. And that is the greatest danger for the church, that we would leave the Word of God. The Word is timeless. The Word holds us true. The Word revives our souls. It's through His Word that we know that we need His grace and His forgiveness, and that all is what the pastor must lead. Look at the last one that is there. The church must recognize and follow godly, faithful leaders given by God. Now, we see this very unashamedly proclaimed throughout Titus. Do you remember these statements where he says, don't let anyone contradict you on this. Stand firm in the truth. You, you Proclaim these things. Do not apologize about these things. I mean, that, that's the whole flavor of what he's saying. He's saying, insist on these things. Well, if he is staying in the Word and he's not a fraud, you're safe to accept his leadership and to follow him. That still means you need to pray for him, and that still means that you need to help him to stay in the truth. Let me tell you that one of the things that helps Pastor Ben and helps me and Pastor Lucas and the other leaders in the life of this church, Pastor Fred, to stay in the truth is the accountability of the congregation that looks to us. That is a good thing for me. It is a good thing to know that my Ketricide is seeking to watch my life. It is a good thing to know that Carlos is saying, so, is this what a Christian is supposed to be? Now, it's a very humbling thing, and it's, it's sometimes an overwhelming thing. It, it feels that way. But let me tell you that this is the picture that we are to recognize and follow godly leaders because it is good for us. In Hebrews, we see that it is good for you to follow those who God gives to you to lead you. Look at the third thing that is here, a third thing that we need to be aware of that we see in Titus, and it's so beautiful and so critical, and I'm going to ask you to circle a couple of things here, but number three is this. We see, and we need to remember, the transforming power of the gospel to change a life and a society. God's power through the gospel not through your will, not through your righteousness, but the true gospel of God is what changes our life. And I want you to see this, and I'm going to ask you to, to make a big box, flip your page back over, and look with me at chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. I hope if you keep this page for the rest of your life, and occasionally you refer to some of your notes from Titus, I hope that you see that verses 11 through 14 have been circled on your page, or a big box was put around chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Why? Because if chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 are not there, the rest of it is impossible. If we lost that part of the original parchment, we'd be sunk it'd be impossible for us to do the rest of what's being said. So chapter, 11 through four, or chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 are critical to us. Let's remember this. Look what it says in verse 11, that, that we are to have the right leaders, we're to recognize the wrong leaders and get rid of them, and to where to hold on to the doctrine, and that's what chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 is all about. Teach right doctrine and live it and here's the reason why in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. Is that what's being promoted on television? Is that what's being marketed um, all around the world? No. No. 
This is a very different life than we see our present world embracing. So look what it says in verse 12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus. And here it is. Look at this. Here's the gospel. Verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us? from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for what? Good works. And so the only way that we can live out all of what Titus is being told by the Apostle Paul, the only way for us to live it out is the hope of the gospel. Um, this should be very liberating to some of you. Some of you have been thinking, man, I've got to get my Christian life together. I've got to get it together. And there's so much, I, I just have to do these things. Or maybe you've been so discouraged because you just, you can't live the Christian life. And I would be like my mother and look at you. And I said that to her as a freshman in college. I said, Mom, I, I just can't live the Christian life. And my mom said, yeah, you're right. In fact, um, we've been waiting for you to figure that out. She said, you can't do it. It's the power of the gospel in you. It's the power of the Holy Spirit living in you that causes you to live a life that is not like the world. And so this is the transforming power of the gospel. Flip your page over and look at the other one that is there. Verse, chapter 3, and right at the top of the page, chapter 3, verse 4 through 7, is this other repeat of the gospel. Again, we see this idea of appearing. Look at verse four. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of what? The Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Put a big box around verses 4 through 7, so you got to do a little edge there around verse 8, but I want you to put a box around that. These two boxes that you have made on this show us where the power to obey comes from, shows us where the hope of our salvation comes from. It comes through the appearing of Jesus Christ. It comes through the sacrifice of the second person of the Trinity on the cross for our sins. When he redeems us and rescues us and snatches us out of the fall into hell, this is the beauty of God's grace and God's goodness, and this is the transforming power. The good news is you don't have to transform your own life. All you have to do is come in faith to Jesus, and he will transform your life. This is the power of the gospel. Number four that we need to see here is this beautiful picture of the God's ultimate priority on good works. God has this tremendous priority, this massive priority on good works, and that's right living. Um, so when we, we see through this, this whole letter, good works is brought up several times, and we're going to notice that in just a minute, but the first bullet point is this. Good works are a major theme of Titus, of Jesus, and of the rest of the Bible. I can't wait to make some of you nervous here in just a minute. Okay, Notice with me verses, I have a little list there of these verses. Flip your page back over, and I want you to underline some things. And underline Titus chapter 1 and verse 8. Titus chapter 1 and verse 8. We see good works listed that elders better be characterized by. So in verse 8 it says, but hospitable, a lover of what? Of good, self-controlled, Upright, holy, and disciplined. Those are good works that need to be in an elder's life. Now look at chapter 2 and verse 7 and underline this. Paul writes to Titus and he says to him in verse, chapter 2 and verse 7, show yourself in all respects, underline this, 
to be a model of what? Circle the words, good works. And in your teaching, show integrity and dignity. But he says, show yourself to be a model of good works. Look at, go down the page to verse 14. Here we see Jesus' good works. In verse 14 it says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession. And notice this, underline the last part of this, who are zealous for what? Good works. Circle the two words, good works. You see, this keeps coming up. When you see something in the Bible being repeated, it means it's important. And so it, it means it's central to the message. Flip the page, or excuse me, no. Look at, the, look at chapter 3 and verse 1 down there toward the bottom. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be, look what it says, obedient, underline it, to be ready for what? For every good work, circle the words good work. I want you to see that this is so critical. Flip the page safely. Look at this. Chapter 3 and verse 8. We see it again. The, trust, the saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those, underline this, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to what? Circle good works. Over and over and over again, Paul is saying to Titus, the people of Crete, the churches of Crete, they must be shown that their lives should reflect Jesus, not the world around them. And then finally, I want you to see it said even again so beautifully in verse 14. At the very end of the letter, remember we said that sometimes your final words are so important um, when something's about to change, you're about to go to battle, or your kids are going out, or whatever it is that you, you give final words and those instructions are important. Look where verse 14 winds up. It's at the end of the letter. In verse 14 he says, and let our people learn to what? Devote themselves to what? So circle the word good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. So throughout this, we see good works keep popping up. And it's because good works are important to God. Good works are important, and they were certainly important to the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5 and John chapter 14, we see that Jesus is proclaiming a life lived by God, lived for God, is a life that will be characterized by works that show him to the world, that represent him to the world. In fact, in James chapter 2, and there's many other passages that we could look at, but when we studied the James passage, in James chapter 2, it says, hey, faith without works is what? Okay, let's say that out loud together, okay? Faith without works is dead. That was about half of you. Let's all say that out loud. It's very important. Faith without works is dead. So you can proclaim that you believe, but it's showing that you don't believe. Faith without works is simply really no faith at all. It is a contrived false faith that is not there. There's, there's many people that say, oh yeah, I know God, and I know Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. <clears throat> and they never come to worship, and their life is characterized by things in the world, and they, they really look a whole lot more like the world than they look anything like God. You see, that person can claim to be a Christian and can claim to know it, but the proof is in the way you live. And that is part of what Titus is saying. Now, let's look at this a little bit further. Two satanic distortions concerning our good works. There are two satanic distortions concerning good works. So Satan loves, similar to what Kerry was talking about earlier, Satan loves to deceive people based on these two things. First of all, about good works, he would say that they are salvific. The first one is salvific. That's the idea that they are 
brings salvation. S-A-L-V-I-F-I-C. That's talking about salvation. That by good works, you can be saved. That is, in fact, one of the most common lies in all religion, in all religion around the world, is that your works will save you. Over and over and over through the Scripture, we see that our works cannot save us. The second lie that comes into the life of the church very often is, oh, well, good works are really optional. You know, it'd be nice if you did those things, but because of Jesus, you know, it doesn't really matter. You said that prayer, you filled out that card, you were dunked in the water in front of everybody, you know, you're good. Well, actually, that's simply not true. And we begin to look at the Scripture and we begin to see that good works are very important to God. They're not optional. And we begin to see that it really is a true indicator. In fact, I want you to notice this with me, that it's not just optional. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 makes clear that our good works cannot save us. They cannot and they do not save us. But let's go on and let's look here with me. The third bullet point is, however... We are, in fact, saved by good works. Now, just, just kind of think about that. We are, in fact, saved by good works. This is where some of you go, what? Didn't you read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's not the result of works, so that no man can boast. Well, here's the beautiful thing that keeps being heralded in this You see, it's not our good works that save us, but it is the good works of Christ that save us. And so when we we look at how important works are, we first look to Jesus, and we first look to see that the second person of the Trinity, God in heaven, leaves heaven and comes down, born into the form of a baby, under very scandalous circumstances, is laid in a horse's stall, shows his humility to the world, rises up, grows up within a a nation of the world that is rejected, and his own people reject him, and then he lays down his life to be the sinless sacrifice for our sins. This is the amazing work of Christ. And it's not only the work of Jesus laying down his life, being crucified on a cross unto death until he breathes out his last words, and then he's laid in a tomb, but the work of God in raising him from the dead comes and brings to us salvation and life in Christ. So that's the second one that is here. The saving work of Christ's death and resurrection brings to us salvation and true life. So, it's not that works aren't important. If there were not good works, there would be no salvation. The first good work begins with God. And the first good work that begins with God brings to us the capacity to do works that are godly works. And true Christians will do that. I want you to notice on the screen Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. Look what it says. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's the, the, the lostness, the fallenness of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Look at verse 14. How did he do it? by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands that he set aside, nailing it to the cross. You see, this is the work of Christ, nailing your sins in Jesus to the cross. In fact, the very next passage that is here is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16 and 17. Go to the third slide of that. I want you to see just verse 21. In verse 21, we see this, and it's underlined there in the bottom. Uh, Look at what verse 21 says. For our sake, he, that is God, made him to be sin. That's God made Jesus to be sin. Who knew no sin? Jesus knew no sin, yet God made him to be sin. And look what it says there. 
so that in him we might become the very righteousness of God. You see, this is the work of Christ dying on the cross for our sins. This is the first grand and glorious work that our soul must embrace. And so in Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, look at the screen on this one. This is so beautiful. Therefore, as one trespass led, condem led to condemnation for all men, and who was the one who first sinned? Okay, we would say Adam, the sin of Adam, Adam and Eve. So as, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men, for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, I love this at the end, so by the one's obedience the many will be made righteous. So the work of Christ, here's the idea, man has the capacity to get himself into a mess that he can't get himself out of. But Jesus in his love, in his grace, comes and gets us out of that mess for all who believe. Um, this is the beautiful picture of his great work on our behalf. Look at the last part of this year. Our good works that Titus keeps hammering on, or that Paul keeps hammering on through Titus, our good works are the result and the evidence that God's grace has redeemed us. Our good works, that is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Our good works, the way I live, is the evidence that I am really God's. Now, it's not the means by which I become God's. I can't save myself. Ephesians is so clear. And even Titus says in that first passage that we put a box around, it's not our righteousness, but it's all found in what God did through Jesus when he came and he redeemed us for this beautiful thing that we might really live it. So before we read the final passage, just look over this page. Look over these four things. The Bible has contemporary relevance to your life. We see it through the problems that the church experiences in God's fixes. Look at the next part. God in his grace gives faithful leaders to the church. Even in this day and time when so many seem to be so strangely going awry, God is still at work and he's still raising up his people to lead his people. Look at the third one. It all centers on the transforming power of the gospel. There is no hope to living any of this out unless grace appeared, and grace did appear in Jesus. And all of this is so that we might live lives of faith, living before God, true to Him, and not true to the world or even true to our own flesh but living as people who have been redeemed for a different life. You see, let me be real clear. This is why Christians are not to be known as liars. This is why Christians are not to be known as cheaters. This is why Christians are not to be known as troublemakers. This is why Christians are not to be known as fornicators people who ignore God's rules about sexuality. This is why Christians are not to be known as pornographers. This is why Christians are not to be known as greedy. This is why Christians are not to be known as materialistic. This is why Christians are not to put confidence in the flesh and be sensual and be obsessed with appearance. This is why Christians are not to be known as constantly trivial, only thinking about the things that are temporal. This is why Christians are not to be known as selfish. This is why Christians are not to be known as flying off the handle and filled with anger and rage, uncontrolled. You see, it matters the way we live to God. It matters because 
Our life is what he has chosen to use to proclaim to those who have not yet believed who he is so that they may see our good works and come to glorify the Heavenly Father. But they, they won't do that so long as they see us as being ungodly. You see, the greatest witness that the church has is actually our love for each other. The greatest witness that we have is that when God's people love each other and the world looks at us and they go, you dudes are different. Why are you like that? One of your best friends is Hispanic and another one of your best friends is black and one of your other best friends is rich and one of your other best friends is poor? How did you guys do that? Because see, the world just, it doesn't naturally think that way. So the way we live confesses Christ. Notice here with me the last passage, and I want you to notice this. We often read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and we don't look at verse 10, but it's, it, it's equally as powerful and, in fact, makes our point as we close our series of, of Titus. Verse 8 says, For by grace... You have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one can boast. Look at verse 10. For we are his what? Circle that. That's good work. We are his workmanship. He has done it in us. We are his workmanship. And why are we created? In Christ Jesus Underline it, for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Fill it in, that we should walk in them. God made us for good works. God made us to live like Him. God made us to live holy lives that are devoted to His glory by faith, looking forward to a glory that is yet to come, that has not yet been revealed except through the promises in the work of Jesus. Amen? May Titus cause us to be Christians that look seriously at the beauty of his word, that look seriously at the way that we live, all for his glory. Would you stand? And just notice the screen as you stand. And that's why we need Titus. We need to be reminded that God's word is timeless. We need to be reminded that leaders matter. We need to be reminded that God expects us to live like him. We need to be reminded that his grace flows over us.